Hello and welcome to the How To Carnivore podcast. I'm your host, Simon Lewis, and you're tuning into the Plant Free MD series with Dr. Anthony Chafee. Dr. Chafee is a surgeon, nutritional researcher, and former pro rugby player. He's been strict carnivore for three years and an on and off carnivore for more than 20. Dr. Chafee looks and feels like a real life superhero. If losing fat, building muscle, finding focus, and getting the most out of life is important to you, you're going to love the Plant Free MD series. Hey everybody, Simon here again with the How To Carnival podcast, and we're joined with Dr. Chafee, the Plant Free MD, and today's topic is why humans are carnivores. So I think the uh, the best place to start, Dr. Chafee, is um, something that we've talked about before uh, in that uh, you can find you can't find any nutrients in plants. I think I'll put this back to front. Uh, there are nutrients in meat that you cannot find in plants, but there are no nutrients in plants that cannot be found in meat. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that, you, that are essential for life. Yeah. So, you know, you, there are things found in meat that you have to have to live mm. that, you know, that are not found in plants or fungus. And, but there is nothing in the plant or fungi kingdom that you have to have that you cannot get out of meat. Which yeah. makes so to me that that well. means that we're obligate carnivores. We have to eat meat. You yeah, know, we cannot survive without the nutrients found in meat. Now you could take a supplement, but you know we're talking real life here. We're talking you know uh, uh, how we evolved. We're talking natural. So you know no one is a supplementivore. Okay, <laughs> this is something that we've just made up recently. And um, and so you know historically you had to eat meat in order to get these nutrients. Now we can give some supplements and so forth, and that's all well and good, but plants also have a lot of toxins, obviously, and that those cause harm. So it's, it's not as simple as just nutrients. Yeah, for sure. So it's, it's a hell of a lot simpler to just start with meat and use that as a foundation. Uh, yeah. And then if you want to add plants in, sure you can. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Another thing that, that we've spoken about or sort of touched on before is fiber. Now we get mm. hammered into us uh, in media and by food companies that we need fiber for a healthy gut and also um, for bowel movements. I mean, even like uh, those, there's products like Metamucil and supplements that you take, um, which is supplemental fiber uh, if you're jammed up and you can't go to the bathroom. Um, but you and I have spoken before about the damage that fiber can cause to our gut. Um, so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on fiber in the context of the human gut. Yeah. So the human gut is not, uh, is not designed to uh, deal with fiber. Uh, we've lost that ability. We had it millions of years ago, as, as can be seen by the fact that we have an appendix, little tiny guy that uh, is a vestigial organ. You know, people grow up learning about this as, as kids. I certainly did that an appendix is a, a vestigial organ, meaning that millions of years ago, it did something, but we stopped using it. And so that, ability has gone away and it's just sort of shriveled down. Well, what it used to be is a four foot long cecum. And that's where fiber would pack into and break down into short chain fatty acids wow. through the specific bacteria that would be cultured there. That's what happens in chimpanzees and gorillas and other hindgut digesters. And so we don't have that ability anymore. We've lost that. So we cannot break this stuff down. And in fact, fiber can cause harm in a number of ways. First of all, it causes micro abrasions to your gut lining, can increase permeability, a leaky gut. It can also cause an inflammatory reaction, increased mucus secretion, and even autoimmune dysregulation. So big harm there. Another thing that it does is it blocks the absorption and breakdown of the nutrients that you actually want. So it actually gets in the way. So when you are eating a steak or even, you know, a vegetable that has some nutrients, that fiber gets in the way, your body can't break it down. It can't get it out of the way. So the enzymes can't get to every single uh, nutrient and break that down. And also now that's being blocked from the villi in your small intestine from being absorbed. So you don't break it down and you don't absorb it as well. And this was an argument on why the fiber is so good is because it, it blocks your body from getting nutrition and this will help you lose weight. I don't mm -hmm. think there's any evolutionary model that exists or ever has existed that runs on the basis of limiting the amount of nu nutrients that you need. Most animals are starving to death and fighting for survival. So the idea of like, oh my God, no, it's just always going to be just such an abundance of energy and food source. And 
And so obviously you need to have developed a way to like block that out and get rid of these harmful nutrients. That doesn't make any sense to me. We don't have the ability to break down fiber. We lost that millions of years ago because we stopped eating fiber millions of years ago. This is another piece of evidence to show that we are carnivores because we stopped eating, we were eating meat for millions of years, but we fully stopped about two and a half, three million years ago when the ice ages hit. And, you know, this killed off a lot of the plants It killed off a lot of the animals that ate the plants, only the, the big woolly mammoths and bison and so forth and their, their predecessors we were able to dig under the permafrost and get at the grasses and so forth. These things were able to survive. And then the big predators that hunted them, including our ancestors. And if our ancestors weren't adapted to hunting these megafauna because they had been doing it already and they had developed tools and tactics to allow them to take down a woolly mammoth, which outclassed us by every physical metric, then we wouldn't have survived. We wouldn't be here. Um, so there's a lot of evidence for that. And, and fiber is a, is a very good clue. The simple fact that we cannot break it down, we cannot absorb it, um, is a very good clue as to the fact that we're not herbivores because all herb herbivorous animals that eat fibrous plants can break down fiber to a certain extent. That is their mm. main nutrition source. Uh, we can't do it. And so that, that's very good information. There's also a study with thousands of people showing the only association with different sorts of things and colon disease. So, you know, they always say that fiber is good for your bowels, it's good for your colon because it just moves things through. Uh, no, actually, this causes your bowel to work overtime. You're, you're constantly pushing things through. It's constantly having to work and having to work and having to work and having to work. And eventually it fails just like heart failure. When you, when your blood's pumping against a gradient, a high pressure gradient, and it eventually after decades, it just wears out. The same thing happens with your colon. If you're just eating so much fiber, it can do this as well. So the only things associated with an increased, uh, with an increased correlation with uh, diverticulosis, which is outpouching of your distal colon, the, the last part of your colon right before your rectum were increased fiber intake, increased number of bowel motions a day. Those are the only two things I think that you have an association. To, it could, Say that again? If we can just rewind a little bit. So the, um, what's, what's the condition that you're talking about that's caused by the fiber? Uh, diverticulosis. So diverticulosis is, a, is an outpouching of your distal colon and that's and that can cause problems because you can get bits of food and so forth stuck in that and it can get infected and you have a, quite a big problem you can fix that with just antibiotics sometimes people need surgery to resect that and it's a very serious condition out pouching do you mean that it's come outside your body or what what's actually happening there you know just just on the tube itself so you have this tube here and they just basically blow bubbles on the surface oh, right okay. and so it, it outpatches on on the colon itself mm -hmm. and so uh, they called di diverticulae so it's just like a, a, it's it's sort of like if you think of like a hernia where like tissue sort of pushing through your abdominal wall same idea this thing's just sort of this bubble sort of erupted thing uh, erupted off the top of that and so now food can go through the the um you know the lumen of the intestine and sort of sit in that little pouch and you know, rot there and become a problem and, and can cause damage and, and become infected. So, and, and this is another thing, whenever you get diverticulosis or you have bowel, you know, bowel surgery or something like that, hmm. you know, bowel surgeons put people on a low residue diet to rest the bowel. So they put them on a very low fiber diet and say, Oh, you gotta, you gotta get rid of that fiber. Don't eat seeds. Don't eat nuts. Don't eat anything like that because this stuff can get caught in there. So make it worse. And this will be a problem. And then as soon as it's done, like, Oh, better eat a high fiber diet to take care of that, you know, bad colon of yours. It's like, wait, wait, you, where were you yesterday when you were telling me to do the exact opposite? Oh, you have these, these hard stools and that's going to make it harder for you to pass. And then that will, will cause that organ to fail, need more fiber. Let's push it through and it won't be a problem. No, actually it's the opposite. So these were all guesses. There were a lot of things in medicine that were just guesses or based on, you know, pretty faulty information or even fraudulent information, which years later we look back on and go like, nope, that's wrong. And that gets changed, that gets changed all the time. Um, so nothing is set in stone, really. I mean, there are some things that are just like, we have just a ton of evidence to show this, but, you know, everything's up for grabs, you know, and, and especially these sorts of things where we've just made a guess, we just made an educated guess based on limited information and we haven't really done the studies. So studies were done for this and it's showing that, no, that's exactly the opposite. And so increased meat, increased fat, increased protein, constipation, 
did not contribute, were not even associated as risk factors, didn't had no correlation, no with, with an increased level of diverticulosis, only fiber, only increased bowel motion. So fiber is not good for you. This causes problems mm -hmm. in your gut as opposed to being good for your gut. Mm. It's, it's funny that the that fiber is causing constipation, yet there's all those products out there like Metamucil that basically okay. like you, yeah. you take that, it completely expands in your system. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you do need to go to the bathroom, but it's it's kind of like, you know, if you're adding more poison to, to sort of get this result that releases it. Yeah, well, you're you're also adding bulk. You're adding bulk to your system. You, yeah. you know, so so the problem with, with constipation, you know, you have to dry this stuff out. So they said, if you eat fiber, it'll move, it'll increase the motility of your gut, and will and your gut will be able to move this stuff faster, which has never been proven. That's just something that they say, and so this will move it through your gut, you know, before it can dry out in your colon. Why are you fighting your colon here? Your colon's supposed to draw water out. That's its that's its job. It's conserving moisture. So you you think that you have to micromanage that and actually do something that counteracts your that organ's entire job? You might be on the wrong side uh, here. And so, in fact, it's you know as as I've discussed before uh, with you and on other other uh, videos. It's actually fat that drives your digestion. It's actually fat that keeps your bowel uh, bowel motion soft. And so it's that excess. You know, we can only absorb a certain amount of fat uh, until we run out of bile. Then it's very difficult for us to absorb fat. And that excess fat that we don't absorb gets into your stool, and that's what keeps it soft because oil repels water. So your stool is already going to be as dry as it's going to get because it's it's, it's completely desiccated anyway, uh, or nearly as such. And you know it can sit in your colon until Christmas. It's never going to get, you know, fat's never going to get drier than it already is. And it's already, and it's already uh, soft. So it's going to stay soft. So it doesn't matter if you get rid of all the water, if you have, if you're eating enough fat and you have a bit of fat excess, and that's how you know how much fat you're getting on a carnivore diet. If you're constipated, you need to eat more fat. If you're having loose stools, you need to pull that back. And obviously if you're eating, um, you know, different sorts of things like, you know, drinking coffee or having artificial sweeteners and uh, certainly the sugar alcohols like sorbitol and xylitol and those sort of, those absolutely cause diarrhea and, and loose stools. Assuming that you don't do any of that, assuming that you only do meat and water like I do, and you're having loose stools, just pull back on your fat. Um, and so uh, the fiber isn't actually helping there. You can actually get problems because you're increasing that bulk to such a degree that now you have this big block of wood and it gets dried out and gets stuck because a lot of elderly people have low gut motility anyway, they have neurogenic colons. And so it actually, it's just going to slow down anyway. If they were eating fat, that wouldn't matter, but they're eating a bunch of fiber and low fat. And so they have big problems. They get a lot of bowel obstructions and so forth. They have very painful mm -hmm. motions and they are, you know, get impacted and so forth. And they have to, uh, you know, get that treated. And it's not, it's not a pleasant treatment. You sometimes you have to do it manually. I have to do a manual uh, disimpaction. I unfortunately had to do that in my second year as a doctor in the, yeah. in, in the emergency department. And this, this poor lady was just in so much pain. And I, you know, I did an exam and it was just like, it was just rock hard. It was there. And it was just like, okay, this is what we got to do. And normally you try to take off a little chunk. This wouldn't, I, I, so I tried to get this out. It came out in a whole one big chunk. It was Bloody probably hell. that big, you know, so I don't know, 600 ml of just rock hard stool and, um, and some blood definitely oh, came God. out. And afterwards it was like, she, I, I, I was just, she was just my biggest fan ever. She was, Oh my God, thank you so much. Because you're in so much pain. Mm. You're in so much distress when you have a tube in your body blocked, like your, like your bowels or your uh, bladder, it That's is horrible. Horrifically painful. I've never had anyone thank me more in my, in my entire career than if when I've like put in a catheter, yeah. a urinary catheter for someone who's in acute retention or that lady that uh, we, we got unstuck or, you know, someone who had, we're able to treat them medically and uh, give them medications to, to clear that out. Um, and uh, yeah, people are so thankful because it, you're in so much pain because your body's telling you like, this is about to explode. And if this explodes, you're dead. And so that's a, that's a big signal to your body to stop whatever the hell it is you're doing. So she, she so, was all jammed up from eating too many fibrous plants and, 
a yeah. two and not enough fat in her diet. So it's kind of like this yeah. sort of forming like this rock of yeah, exactly plant matter, basically. In yeah, well, it's, it's growing and growing. Yeah, it's wood, isn't it? I mean, fiber is, is cellulose, right? So I mean, that's, that's yeah, right. what wood is. And so when they're increasing the amount of fiber in, in food, they actually add sawdust. That's a real thing. All right. And so there are so many, there are dozens and dozens and dozens, probably hundreds or even thousands of processed food products that add sawdust in order to increase fiber. Because now fiber has been officially recognized as an essential nutrient. You have to have it or you'll die. That's what is, essential means. Is, is it actually a nutrient? Can you classify it as a nutrient? Um, well, I mean, they can classify anything as anything. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's real. Uh, no, it's not a nutrient. It's, and it's certainly not essential. <laughs> and so, but they have, they have classified it as an essential nutrient. An essential nutrient means that if you don't get enough of this, you'll have a deficiency and you can die. Okay. Like, you know, you know, some you know, various vitamins and the different deficiencies and the diseases that you get from that, you know, berry, berry, scurvy, all these sorts of things. And so you know, saying that someone that, you know, is an acute uh, deprivation of fiber. fiber. I've, I've never actually heard that. I've never actually heard what, what uh, condition that would cause. I certainly haven't run across it myself. Zero so, constipation, I maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. So like, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's just, uh, it's, it's a very strange thing that they would have done, but because they've done that and because it's a buzzword and because it's a marketing tool, everybody wants fiber. You have to be eating more fiber, more fiber, oh, yeah, more fiber. Yeah. So they add fiber and it's, and it's sawdust. There was, there's another thing too, you know, mobile call is just something we use as a stool softener and, and uh, a laxative. And you're actually, you can get people unstuck by giving them a bunch of this stuff. This stuff actually has been shown to cause leaky gut. This is not good. You know, so you're giving this to someone to help mm. their digestion. You're actually ruining it. So you get leaky gut, which, you know, you have these tight binds between, um, the, the cells in your gut as actually breaks those. So now it's the cells are physically not touching like they would. Now it's, you're talking nanometers here wide, but normally they're, they're stuck by these tight junctions and they're just, then they're stuck there. And so molecules pass a certain, uh, certain size can't pass through them. Generally, you know, you have to, you know, there's different charges and different sorts of ways of, of keeping this barrier protection in your gut. Um, but once you unstick those and you break those mm. tight bindings, now it's flapping loose and things can literally just penetrate into your body. And they do. And this is, this is why you get, you know, lectins are a big part problem here. Gluten, weak gluten, even people that aren't celiac, uh, the gluten can cause leaky gut and can break these, um, these junctions between the cells. And now you can get these things sucking into your body, like lectins, which then cause havoc in your body. There's a ton of different, different kinds of lectins, but quite a lot to go into for this episode, but they can cause a, a myriad of problems. They can emulate insulin. They can hit on your insulin response or re receptors. They can increase uh, peripheral insulin resistance, which increases adiposity and, and fat de uh, deposition. Uh, it can cause autoimmune disorders and cause all sorts of different problems. So uh, nasty, nasty stuff. And we're giving people Movacol, which actually exacerbates these problems mm -hmm. uh, in the first place. Mm -hmm. So is that, is that generally we're, like we're doing a, things very backwards here. Yeah. Is that generally in like a hospital treatment, like extreme cases, or is that something that a lot of people are taking? A lot, a lot of people are taking this. You can get this over the counter, but we do use it in hospital all the time. We'll put people on Movacol when we're putting them on opiates or something like that, or they just uh, haven't you know, been opening their bowels or something like that. And yeah, so it's very, very common. It's, it's one of the most common uh, stool softeners that we use in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I always think, you know, because we, you know, we, we do surgery on people and quite often, you know, we can't, especially if you're doing spinal surgery, we can't let them go until they open their bowels. And, you know, I was just thinking, I was like, you know, if I, if I ever have to get this kind of surgery, they're not going to let me out for a week because I just, I just don't go. <laughs> so it's not going to be like anything's wrong, but because, you know, I eat a, carn a carnivorous diet, I don't have all this excess waste that my body's trying to get rid of. And so I absorb 98, 99% of the food that I eat. And so I just, I don't have waste that accumulates to such a degree. And so it's like, you know, once a week, maybe I have to do this and they'll just, they'll, they won't let me move. They'll probably try to stuff down a bunch of laxatives down my throat, which I won't take. And we're just going to have a, have a standoff, but uh, yeah. <laughs> to be a fly on the wall, if that ever happens.
Yeah, that'd be funny. They 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 would they would get a a few lectures. About yeah, <laughs> medicine in general, how the body works. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, it's when you're on strict carnivore, not needing to to do a number two is a is a pretty weird experience. I remember um, going through that and thinking I haven't taken a crap for two or three days, and then when I when I did, it was like a it was like a rabbit. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is the opposite to you imagine a vegan going like three or four times a day um yeah. and doing you know really hard, often really hard i imagine um all yeah. right probably probably enough stool and number two chat <laughs> <laughs> um what about the acidity level in our stomachs um how does that kind of suggest that we're carnivores yeah so you know you can look at the whole digestion from you know teeth all the way down um and and we have these carnivorous adaptations always remember we are we are primates and so we have a lot of things to do with our primate heritage. And so we're not going to have four stomachs like a cow. And we're not going to have big teeth like a, like a, like a feline, which is not so, um, or, or different teeth also, you know, for different reasons as well. But, you know, we have, we are primates first and foremost with carnivorous adaptation. So, you know, to do with our, our stomach, as you mentioned, our pH is extremely low. It's one of the lowest in nature. So it's like, you know, like one, 1.5, 1.8 pH, which is extremely acidic. Okay. You know, seven is about neutral, right. And then like 14 is super basic. And then, you know, zero is, you know, as, as absolute acidic as you can get, which you can't get really. Um, and so we're at 1.5, 1.8 and that's sort of the pH that you would see in like vultures and other carrying animals. They're eating diseased you know, toxic, broken down meat that's, that's rotting. And so they need to be able to kill off this horrible bacteria, uh, in their stomach acid. So we actually have that and, and we, we can, and this is, this is actually why, you know, people like Dr. Jay Salisbury would say you shouldn't eat, you shouldn't drink water for two hours before or two hours after you eat a meal, because you're, you're going to water down your stomach acid. And it's going to make it less the, the, the pH go up which means you're not going to be able to break down your food as readily and, and you won't get as much out of it. Have you, have you tried that? Say that again. Have you tried that? I've never been as strict as that. Yeah. And, you know, but I, I'm so used to, you know, when we grow up, like that's when we drink a lot of water is when we yeah, at the dinner sad. table, my, you know, my, my parents would always, say, okay, you know, drink enough water, drink enough water, drink enough water. You'll, does everyone want water? Do you want more water? And we're just drinking water all the time. Never really thought about it. So when I start eating, I naturally want water, but I try to limit it. And I do try to eat water at other times, but I, I end up, I end up drinking uh, water around that time. But I, I'm, I have noticed a difference when, you know, the more I do that, I, I tend to excrete less waste, meaning that I'm breaking down things better. I'm absorbing things better. And um, I haven't really noticed, I haven't really thought about it enough to see how it made me feel in general. I think I'm still feeling pretty good, but I, I'm, you're, you're, likely to be able to break these things down better and absorb them better if you do that. And that's certainly what Salisbury pointed out. And it would make sense as well, given the fact that, you know, our, we were going to be raising our pH mm. if we drink a bunch of water. And mm. it's something I want to try actually yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna, try that for you know, a few weeks and, and just see how I go. Yeah. I'm curious to experiment with that. Now that you mentioned that I've never heard this before. Now that you mentioned that I can, I'm sort of thinking of being in a restaurant and often in a restaurant, your, your water glass is constantly being filled up. Uh, and then when you eat, you kind of are eating and you can tell there's a lot of water and liquid in your gut. So it's, yeah, no, I'm going to give that a go. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's worth, it's worth trying out. And, and Salisbury also says, well, you, know, you should be drinking like either warm water or at least room temperature water as well. And that, and that can, that can help also, but you know, either way, I think that the, the timing of it, I think would make a big difference just because of mm -hmm. the, the pH, um, you know, other, other sort of adaptations that we have uh are that our small intestine is actually quite long in comparison to the rest of our gut and this is where most of the you know the meat and the fat is getting broken down and absorbed in this area and then a bit of waste is getting into our colon and then just basically drying out we don't really absorb anything in our colon as opposed to gorillas and chimpanzees and other uh, herbivorous primates and there are carnivorous primates as well um you know uh, apart from humans but 
the herbivorous ones are called hind gut digesters. They do most of their digestion breakdown and absorption in their hind gut, in their lower uh, intestine. And so that's, that's the opposite with us. You know, we have a smaller, uh, large intestine colon, they have a longer one and they have this long cecum. So we don't have those changes anymore. This is very different anatomy compared to herbivorous primates. And you look at the carnivorous primates as well. They have a gut more similar to ours as well. They don't have the big long colon where they would be able to, or a cecum where they would be able to break down fiber. They have a longer, small intestine and so forth. And, you know, slightly lower pH generally with herbivores, you would see a much higher pH, much closer to neutral uh, in their, in their stomach acid as well. And you see carnivores have lower pH and you see the scavengers like vultures and things like that have, have the lowest of all. And we had that. And the idea behind that is that for millions of years, like we're not hunting much with that, especially when we were like three foot tall, <laughs> you know? And so we had to be carrying animals. And so we were scavenging around and, and eating the leavings of, uh, you know, lions and, and what have you at the time. And then we developed, you know, figured out that we could use a rock to crack open a skull and we could get the brains super high nutrients. And that was a, a big food source. And then we started figuring out tools, started using these tools more and more and more. I was using for pound stones for, for, for millions of years, probably there's, there's fossil records that show that. I don't know why it took so many, so long to, to figure out how to then break this thing to give it a sharp point to then use that as a, as a cutting implement but literally millions of years, but, you know, evolution moves very slowly. And so eventually we developed tools and, and increased our intellect as well, uh, subsequently, but we started out as scavengers and we started out having to eat the, you know, the sometimes rotten leavings of other more, you know, more adapted predators that could just take down large animals, uh, fairly fairly easily, which we really couldn't. I think, I think that still happens today. I saw a video, I saw a video on YouTube where it was um, like a lion had made a kill and then a group of Maasai tribesmen turned up with their spears and yeah. they just shooed the lion away. Uh, yeah. And then um, I think it was a zebra and the zebra's theirs. Yeah. I saw that with, um, uh, with cheetahs as well. Same oh, idea. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and these guys, they had, they were, they were fearless. And yeah. they just have this stick and they just start smacking this cheat in the face. And, and they're like, oh, well, one guy's dragging it away and their cheese are freaking out. One guy's just smacking it in the face with this, with this switch. And it's just like, you know, it's getting back and it's getting really aggressive. And it's like trying to fight for its food, but it gets smacked in the face. It doesn't know what, what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> they, just, they just walk off with this yeah. little antelope. Yeah, we'll take and, that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that, that absolutely still happens. But I, I think for a, a while there, before we figured out tools and so forth, yeah, uh, we, weren't, we, weren't, we, we weren't pulling too much away from a lion. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, but yeah, we get, we get the leavings. But yeah, you're, you're right. That, that, uh, that is something uh, that you see. And yeah, you, they use other, other, you know, more capable predators. Yeah, for sure. To take down an animal and then they just you know, poach it away. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Actually, another thing that I saw today was um, it was talking about these uh, Viking uh, explorers in like the year 1200, and they had they had think they'd gone from Greenland and then sailed across um, to North America. Uh, I'm not 100 sure on that, but I, I think so. And they set up this camp, and it was right next to a rotting whale carcass. And basically, they survived through the entire winter because there was a whole whale's body right there on the beach. Um, so I know that doesn't sound very appealing, but this is kind of in line with, with what you're saying about the, uh, low pH, high acidic stomach where, you know, we can handle, uh, these sorts of you know, eating meat and fat that might be kind of close to rotting. And mm. then we can be opportunistic feeders. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, think about how many cultures have a version of rotten ass meat. Yeah, like um you know the no uh you know yeah norwegians have the uh, rotfisk just i think it just means rotten fish really and then, yeah they do and they would, they would pack these in, in big barrels and you know and put salt and things like that big layer of meat salt meat salt salt stuff like that or, or do that with beef as well and this would preserve it this is what they'd use in their in their long voyages they just ate meat they did not get scurvy and that's mm -hmm. why they didn't get scurvy because they weren't eating a bunch of carbs and grains and porridge and so forth 
they were eating meat. And so that's, that's why they were, they, they didn't have to um, worry about that. Um, but yeah, you're right. No, there was, the, it was, I think it was Leif Erikson made it to North America. <laughs> Yeah, um, Matt, your history around. knowledge is yeah. pretty sharp. Yes, that was the name, Ericsson, that was in the video. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, that was like 1100 and something. I don't know, 60 something. But yeah, that, it was right around that time. I hadn't heard the whale story though. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, and um, you know, obviously they, I'm sure they'd be adapted at, at you know, hunting and fishing and so forth as well. But like, if you're just eating a whale, just keep eating that thing. And uh, it's right there. It's easy. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's probably freezing cold. So it's probably not really spoiling that fast. And, you know, like the, in, you know, that's, that's another like, example of this. Uh, I didn't even think about, you know, the movie alive, it was based on the book about a team of rugby players from South America who crashed in uh, you know, the Andes and they survived for like nine months, close to a year by eating the bodies of the, of the people that, died in the crash mm. uh, very harrowing story very very uh you know confronting insane sort of circumstance yeah. you'd have to be in and have to, to turn to cannibalism and so forth but they they live for nine months yeah that's just true eating, they were just eating meat, human human meat. meat. yeah and so oh, you're talking right. about like no 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 you'd get scurvy would you they didn't you know they were they were up in the mountains in the snow and they they did just fine, you know, so, and for nine months, I think it was nine months. So um, yeah, that's another, another sort of example. And also because, you know, it was in the snow and these people just packed in there. They never, they never went bad because they were just, it was their own ice chest, you know? So that, that probably was what happened with that whale as well. Mm. Uh, but yeah, you're right. And uh, that, that's, that's a good example of that, that even if this thing is slightly rotten and so forth, and, you know, they do have, you know, rotten fish, you know, the, the Inuits and so forth, they have, they take fish heads and they sort of, you know, pack them in a jar and just bury them under the house and they rot and they, they take them out six months later. And apparently they just smell horrendous mm. and you either really love them or you really, really, really hate them. Um, I was watching a show on this and they were, they were mentioning this and it was, it was a husband and wife and they were both of, uh, you know, uh, native Alaskan descent and the wife loved these things, just loved them. And so she would always have like a jar going and when the husband would find it, he would just break it and throw it away and not get rid of it because it was so disgusting. And, but she would always have these things stashed and every now and then they'd be ready to go. And she, uh, she would just have them. And he like, wouldn't let her in the house for like several days, like after she eat them, because she just <laughs> reeked with this rotting meat. And, and that's, that's something we do, you know, that's why we have spices as well. That's why the spice trade was such a, was such a you know, huge industry for so long. That was to preserve and cover the taste of rotting meat because you had to eat meat. Meat was very important. It was the staple diet and every, and everyone knew this up until about, you know, 1977 when they got told otherwise. And and so you put on a bunch of uh, spices and so forth to cover this up. And you think about where spices were most prevalent or generally in, you know, the, you know, the, the, the sub-Asian continent, like you know, India, uh, uh, Southern Asia and so forth, where you have, you know, you're in this tropical weather, meat's not going to last very long. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have a cold shed. You're not going to have or a cold cellar like you would in the North where you can cut a big block of ice out of the lake and just put that in your cellar and you'd have a cold room. And that would actually keep that cold and cool throughout the year. It wouldn't be as good as a refrigerator, but it would, it would do a good job. They didn't have that. And so, you know, they had to do other things and cover up the taste of rotting meat because you needed to eat the meat. And, um, you know, because that meat was life. Interesting. Yeah. The spice trade. Um, all right. How about our teeth? Are our teeth made for eating plants, meat or both? Yeah. So again, you know, we have, we have primate teeth and, but again, with carnivorous adaptations, you look about 8 million years ago when our, our ancestors split off from other primates, we did so because we started eating meat, started eating more and more meat, more and more meat and had more and more adaptations. Uh, and until we hit our current iteration. So mm -hmm. then we had larger teeth and larger jaws and larger muscles of mastication. You can look at the skulls and the brain is actually smaller and they have this big ridge that comes over the back. And that's where these big muscles attach so that you could chew because you're chewing hard, tough things like leaves and sticks all day. And you, so you need these big muscles, you need these big jaws. And big teeth as well, because they'll wear down and you know, we don't regrow our teeth like a rat would or a shark would. And so when you run out of teeth, you're, you're, you're not really eating too much. 
So our teeth became smaller and smaller. Our jaws became smaller and smaller. Our muscles of mastication and temporalis muscle became smaller and smaller because we're eating softer and softer food. Meat and fat are very, very soft. You know, we're not chewing on sticks all day like a gorilla, you know, who, ha- who needs big teeth. You know, people say like, well, we don't have fangs and canines like a canine. And it's like, right, well, we don't kill things with our mouths. You know, we couldn't do that. We couldn't kill things physically, except, you know, small animals and whatever. And then we went after carrion. And so we had to develop tools and tactics in order to take down, you know, a mastodon. And so we developed our brains, our intellect came to bear and we developed tools and tactics. And that's why we live in houses and lions and gorillas don't because they have the physical attributes to allow them to get their preferred and optimal diet. You know, people say like, well, you know, we don't have claws that are designed to kill an antelope, but we have a hand that could just pick fruit easily. Right. And so since it's easy, you don't really need much brain power to do it. And so we wouldn't have developed a big, powerful brain just for picking fruit that any idiot can do. So that's not, uh, that's not going to be a, a, an evolutionary driver to grow a big brain, which takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of time. And so evolution uh, isn't going to waste its time developing a brain for nothing. You know, we don't develop traits and we don't lose traits unless there is a, a, a survival advantage to it. And, you know, it doesn't take a much brain power to hunt a lettuce you know, but you do need a lot of brain power to figure out how to take down a woolly mammoth when this is what you're working with, you know, teeth again. So, so teeth, you know, we don't have big fangs and so forth because that's not what we use them for. It's not our weapon. No, exactly. And so, you know, but then you look at gorillas, they have big old canines, big fangs. They, They don't need any meat. They don't use that to hunt. So that argument's out the window. That's just, that's just stupid. You have plenty of uh, herbivores with big fangs and you have carnivores that don't have fangs. Okay. So fangs don't equal carnivore. Okay. Yeah. And people look at though that do picture very simplistic arguments, generally uh, these, these arguments saying that we're herbivores and so forth. And they'll look at your teeth and like, it's just a picture of people's teeth, the front of their teeth and a picture of, you know, animals with their mouths open and so forth. And you're like, oh, look at a hyena and a lion. These like big pointy teeth and so forth. And always these fangs. You look at a horse and a cow, it's just flat in the front. And we have flat in the front. We have flat teeth. No, that's not what flat teeth mean. Flat teeth means that they're planar on a three-dimensional, uh, on a three-dimensional surface. So like the surface um, where your teeth would, you know. Are, like grind back and forth. Yeah, exactly. They would, they would be able to, to, you know, sweep back and forth yeah, whereas like a millstone. Yeah, where we're, we're going like this. And so, you know, we can move our jaws, right? And I say, oh, you know, only herbivores can do that. But clench your teeth and try and move your jaw. It doesn't go anywhere because we have, actually have bicuspid teeth. We don't have flat teeth. Okay, so they get stuck there. So we're not able to mill down uh, grain and grasses and so forth like other, like other animals would. Um, we, we still have that adaptation because we used to be herbivores. We used to do that. We used to need to do that. But again, you know, evolution isn't going to develop a trait or lose a trait unless there's an evolutionary advantage to it. So there obviously just wasn't any advantage to losing the ability to move our jaw side to side. Okay. I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that there would be, but we know that there really wasn't one because it didn't happen. We can still move our jaws. And that, that was just an ability that we already had and it didn't benefit us to lose it. And so we didn't lose it, but our teeth are very different. They aren't flat and they can't, you know, process and mill fiber, uh, like, you know, like a cow's teeth can or a horse's teeth. So they have flat teeth. We don't have flat teeth. And so there's a number of different things you could look at to know that our teeth are adapted for a carnivorous diet and certainly not for an herbivorous high fiber diet. Mm, okay. Interesting. Um, I want to talk about something that we spoke about just before the chat. Uh, and that was uh, the difference between a horse's stomach and a cow's stomach. And I never really kind of put two and two together before, but when you see a horse's crap, um, it kind of looks like you can see the vegetation in it. It looks like 
the compost bin or, 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 or like the grass clippings from the lawn knot is what it looks like. Um, whereas a cow uh, is like brown and smooth and so processed that you can't tell that it was once grass. These are two big hairy animals that both eat grass. Um, how come, you know, I'm guessing this is something to do with the process that's going on inside with them actually digesting um, or getting nutrients from the grass. What's, what's going on here? Yeah. So um, yeah, cows are just much more efficient at getting energy uh, out of fibrous plants and grass than a, than a horse is. I, I, you know, I, I'm just, just from memory, I think that a horse can only get about 20% of the nutrients out of fiber uh, from the grass that they eat, whereas a cow gets like 80%. Wow. Or, may, or possibly even more. And that's because they you know, have this four barreled stomach and they you know, regurgitate that up, chew the cud, break it down again. They have this big, long breakdown process that is able to break it down further and they can get more energy out of that. A horse just has to eat more. It just has to eat more. It has to eat more in order to, to maintain the calories that they need. Um, this, is, um, this is actually uh, another historical sort of fact, you know, why, you know, Genghis Khan and the Mongol horde who were, you know, carnivores, they were completely meat based. They ate horse meat, they drank horse blood, and they were on average six foot four on average adult male was six foot four. I'm six foot three. So I would be, I'd be below average for, you know, the little, you know, we think like, you know, Mongolians as, as, um, you know, little Asian dudes, but no, they were very large men, very large men on very small horses. And they, just a well, horse meat. And well, they were, were, they, were they sort of farming the horses? Like they're riding the horses, but then they've also got this kind of like um, flock of, of horses as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, these things are just breeding all the time. I'm sure they had had surpluses as well. I'm sure that, you know, they, they had certain ones bred for, Eating. you know, riding and so forth that maybe, you know, uh, uh, you know, they didn't probably didn't eat, but they also did bloodletting as well. So if they were on like a long journey or whatever, they would, they would actually, you know, let blood from the horse and they'd put it in a container or whatever, and they would drink it. Amazing. And so that they would drink, they would drink horse blood as well. And so this was, so why they could, they could just, they could go. So the Mongols had the largest contiguous empire that's ever existed. Um, and this is actually where Russia is now. That's part of the old uh, Mongol empire because, um, uh, well, actually you know, there was a, there was a cataclysm of some form. We don't know exactly what, but you know, maybe a volcano, maybe an asteroid, something, something hit blew up a big bunch of dust and plume into the atmosphere for several years. This blocked out the UV, this dropped, blocked out the sun's energy and rays and killed a lot of the vegetation, killed a lot of the grasses and tons of animals died as well. This is, you know, uh, for some reason, what Bill Gates is trying to do. He just did an experiment in, I think in Sweden where they shot up a bunch of uh, particulates to try to block out the, the dangerous energy from the sun is like, buddy, Fuck we only yeah. exist because dude, of the energy. It needs the to sun. stop interfering and let yeah, well, nature that's do it. it. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the, it's the, uh, uh, you know, you have a complex system and you mess with it. You are going uh, to have, you know, it's a lot of unintended results. You know, you, you mess with a complex system. You have no way of predicting. It's so dumb. It's like, the it's end. like, um, you know, introducing the, uh, the cane toads to kill the, to kill the locusts, which yeah. is what we did here in Australia. And now I've got this like cane toad yeah. swarm that in 2022, we can't control. Look, yeah, you lock you out know, the, the sun, it's going to be a worse outcome than just cane toads. That's it. You know, you know, the, the, the cure is worse than the disease. Oh, man. Um, but this one, I mean, this one's not too hard to figure out. I mean, the, the guy's smart enough, you know, Bill, Bill Gates is, is not a dumb man. And we, we literally made, I think Highlander two, was actually about this. It was like in the future. And they, they, there was like all oh, the danger from the sun and we had to block it out to block out the UV light. And then it was just like, it was horrible. It was just all dark and it was rainy. It was ter terrible. And it was this horrible landscape. They're like, oh, we really messed up. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you know uh, the matrix is like that. They scorched the sun, they scorched the sky so that the sun's energy couldn't come in. And then, you know, they had to farm people and so forth. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is bad. This comes out bad. You know, all the major extinctions uh, that we know about are generally from one of these cataclysmic events where the sun's energy gets blocked out and it just destroys life on earth, just completely destroys it. And you have these mass extinctions. Every single one of these things causes a mass extinction. And he's, he's literally trying to do this intentionally, which is crazy to me. Totally and I mean, yes, that's like bond villain level crazy. Yeah. And so something like that happened, uh, in, in to the Mongol horde. Um, and so something hit about that time, kicked up a bunch of dust 
And for years, it killed off a lot of the grasses and a lot of the vegetation. And because horses were much less efficient at getting the energy from grasses, they need a lot more grasses. They weren't able to survive. And so they weren't able to maintain their herds and their empire died out uh, or at least regressed significantly into what is now modern day Mongolia. Um, this is where Russia came from because they had basically their slave population there uh, or at least underclass population were you know, herding uh, cows and they were cow-based. Uh, society. And so they actually were able to survive and thrive because of the cows and because the cows were much more efficient at it. And so they ended up taking over. That, that's where Russia is now because that's a, that's a big chunk of the Mongol Empire. The Mongol Empire stretched from nearly the Atlantic Ocean in France and to nearly all of Asia. is absolutely massive. If you look wow. at it on a map sometime, it is massive. It's the largest, con it's, it's the largest uh, empire that has ever existed pure carnivores. People say it's like, you can't have a civilization without, without agriculture, without farming and so forth. Largest civilization that's ever existed on earth was purely carnivorous and it was 900 years ago. And uh, you look at the native Americans in North America, uh, they were just eating meat. They were just eating, you know, uh, predominantly Buffalo. They had cities uh, in St. Louis, what is now St. Louis, they found, you know, obviously abandoned because there was a, some plague that killed off like 95% of the Native Americans uh, in the sort of early to mid 1600s, just before the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock. And I think it was at 1642 or 1646 or something like that. Anyway, there was, there was some sort of mass extinction of the Native Americans just before that. And all of a sudden people started kind of going west a bit like what's going on what's going on there's no one here what's going on and they started going out and exploring and they, they found settlements they found cities they were just gone there was no one there in st louis they found buildings and structures and all these sorts of things that they estimated could house a million full-time residents wow. in st louis and they had you know, five different massive trade routes that were just beaten into the ground because there's so much traffic going up and down up to the Great Lakes, out to, you know, out west, down, uh, you know, south and east and all these sorts of things, major, major trade routes. And they all came here. And even, even years, even decades after no one had used these things, they were still beaten into the ground because they're so, so, so highly trafficked. But a million people, full-time residents in, in what is now St. Louis, fully carnivore. So the, um, yeah. So the, uh, you know, get back to, to horses, they, they, they just aren't as efficient, but that, you know, that's uh, some, some interesting tie-ins uh, with, you know, historical carnivores as well. It is, it is a good reminder about how efficient and amazing cows are because yeah. they can survive in really hardy environments. You know, you could have a cow living on a nature strip in like, you know, between a highway. I think that's something that's totally been forgotten that, you know, in, in, an, in an ideal society, you really could have cows everywhere and the cows are providing you with meat and they're providing you with milk and they're living off what, you know, we might consider scrub or weeds or whatever. And then they're producing something that's highly, highly nutritious, perfect food for humans. Um, and I mean, you, yeah. don't have to, you don't have to store it when it's on their body. They're just walking around doing their thing. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the thing is too, they can eat things probably more than that. When I was in, when I was in Bangladesh, uh, mm. you know, uh, doing humanitarian work in, in the refugee camps there, uh, I, we saw cows that were sort of all over the place because, you know, they did eat, eat uh, meat there. Um, it wasn't like India where most, most people are uh, vegetarian. Um, they ate a lot of meat there and um, well, when, when they could get it, they were very, very poor, but there were cows. You see cows around these things <laughs> did not eat grass. These things, I call them trash cows because they were literally eating trash. I thought they, because they didn't have any, any trash uh, removal services in Bangladesh. So they just throw trash on the sidewalk. They just throw trash on the ground. And, and a lot of the stuff was, uh, you know, processed, still processed food, you know, had like ruffles, chips and things like that, um, which is crazy. I mean, these people are dirt poor and yet these predatory food companies are coming in and saying, Oh, here, you know, buy our chips. It's like, you know, the food that they can just get locally is going to be a hell of a lot less expensive and a hell of a lot more nutritious. Like you, you guys are, are, are really taking advantage of people who are really, really, really not well off. And I, I think that that's a pretty nasty, um, uh, you know, practice, but in any case they do buy this and they have a lot of this stuff there. And so they have a lot of pa plastic bags, 
You know, I mean, you go through places and there's just jungles. It's just jungles, jungles, jungles in these little villages and this road that goes through a central market and there's everyone's just milling around and these little stores that are like built out of like bamboo uh, and so forth. And they just have stacks and of hanging plastic bags of treats and things like that in the middle of the jungle. It's, it's, it's surreal. And so they throw this stuff out because they don't have anywhere to, to, to dispose of it properly because they never used this stuff before. Everything that they had before would biodegrade or they, you know, they'd use for fuel to burn and this stuff they couldn't. So they just throw it on the ground. And I thought that the cows were sort of eating in the trash. I thought they were sort of moving it out of way to get to the like little nubbins of grass that were underneath it. So I'm like, okay, but it didn't really look around. I'm like, mm, okay. Then when we were going through this little area, there was a, there was a, a bin sort of a large concrete container. There were 20 cows all in this thing, just eating the trash. There was no grass. It was concrete floor. And this is where people would throw all their trash. There's, you know, 15, 20 cows all in there, just eating the trash and trying to get this hyper palatable food and little leavings. And I, I was like, that is crazy. So we call them trash crazy. cows. I took a ton of pictures of these things. They're probably, I should probably put them up on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I might've put some of them on Instagram. Some of my Bangladesh um, pictures are, that's why I started Instagram was just to people kept asking me about my trip to Bangladesh. So I put some of the pictures, some of the more um, easily digestible once because some of these things are, are really, really tragic that you just wouldn't want to see. But um, I think I would have put the trash cows up. If not, I will. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so they can eat, they can eat trash and, oh, uh, and they're just fine. And then, um, but they, yeah, but you're right. You know, they can, they don't have to be in the field. They don't have to, you don't have to clear a field and just grow grass. You know, they, they evolved in these big grassy fields and that's actually what made them very, uh, you know, fertile and so forth. These big grassy plains that came through, you know, you know, North America and so forth, but you don't need to, you can run them through rangeland, you can run them through forest, which is the predominant, uh, type of land that we, that we have on earth. There's only 4% of the earth's surface, including the oceans, obviously are, is arable land where you can have a farm. Uh, or a city, because that's the thing, farms and cities compete for space and only 4% of the world surface is arable land. Mm. Um, but I think, I think forest is like 10 or 15% and then rangeland is like 10 or 15%. Um, one of them is 10, one of them is 15%, I forget which one's which. But the, these are things, so that's 25% of the earth's surface, roughly, that is not suitable for cities, not suitable for farms, uh, is suitable cows. for cows yeah, is yeah. suitable for goats is yeah. suitable for sheep well the, and, I, think the, I think the biggest uh biggest farm in the world is in australia it's, i think it's like owned by the kidman family um and it's you know it's like as big as a state it is like yeah. millions of kilometers square kilometers and the cows roam and you see footage of them and they're in the desert and you think, yeah well what are they eating but they're crossing big they're crossing a lot of land and they're mm -hmm. finding little shrubs and all sorts of things to eat and the you know, and we see the Maasai with their cows in in um you know, uh, in Africa, in Tanzania, and Kenya. There's not that, there's not like open plains of just perfect green grass. It's a, you know, it's an arduous environment. Yet these cows are still able to to find the nutrients they need. Yeah, exactly, and uh, that's what uh, people like Alan Savory has been doing. Where he's taking large herds of animal out through Zimbabwe and around the world, because he's been doing this for 40 years. And I saw some clown um, vegan activist doctor guy, who I think is just very, very misinformed um, of his own volition. I think he works very, very hard to be as misinformed as possible to fit his ideology. But he was talking about Alan Savory and, you know, this guy makes these, these big claims and then doesn't back them up. He just states the statement like it's irrefutable proof. But he was basically making a statement that Savory was doing that, saying that you know people that have uh, you know Galileo syndrome, where they just think they they just know everything and no one else does, and they've got the answer to everything. Uh, they compare themselves to Galileo and so forth, and they make these grandiose uh, proclamations, such as um, you know uh, that uh, appropriate you know livestock uh, farming and management can can reverse global warming, and so he says that that Alan Savory has you know, Galileo syndrome. Um, well, I mean, first of all, you have to show me where exactly he said those words specifically, chief. Uh, and second of all, show me why he's wrong. Okay. Because first of all, I've never heard Alan Savory say that, but he's been doing this for 40 years. 
And he's been getting reproducible results from himself and from other people who learn his techniques. And they do the exact same things. They have the exact same things happen. When you have that reproducibility in a, in a study or a trial or in, in, or in practice, you know that you're onto something, okay? So what Savory is doing is he's taking uh, large herds of animal like you would see in the wild, bunched and moving. So they're not just sitting there just eating down the grass to nothing. You know, they're just eating it down most of the way and then they move on because they're you know, defecating and urinating on their food source. And so they have to keep moving, have to keep moving, have to keep moving and to find you know, palatable bits of, of grass and so forth. So they have to keep moving, have to keep moving. This is very beneficial to the soil. This is very beneficial to the, to the grasses and the plants as it turns out. And there's a lot of reasons for that. People, I think people should I'd be, encourage them to go watch Alan Savory's work and Peter Ballerstedt's work. That guy's brilliant. He's a PhD in forest agronomy. He does a lot of work in this, in this area. There's a lot of very interesting, hard science, fact-based uh, talks on this, on this exact subject. But, you know, so Alan Savory is, uh, is, is, re is reversing deserts. He's getting these things through deserts that, and he just said, he said to people, you know, they drive through some desert area and he said, you know, I'll give, I'll give you 10 pounds if you find one piece of one blade of grass in the next hundred miles or so, you know? And so they would just run these cows through and they just find a little bit, find a little bit, but they do a lot of different things. Their hooves dig in and it sort of changes the ground. So instead when it rains, the water doesn't just run off. It actually pools and settles and soaks in as opposed to just running off and washing off all the seeds and washing mm -hmm. off the, the topsoil. Okay. It settles in now. It, it now it increases the amount of groundwater that there, that there is. Um, they're eating down a bit, they're defecating, they're urinating, they're fertilizing the soil, they're moving seeds around. All of a sudden, plants start growing again. It's a more fertile environment. It's a more uh, habitable environment for plants. And then when plants come back, animals come back, and it's a symbiosis and it gets better and better and better. And so he has these areas where you look at this farm, th this farm next to this farm, there's a little fence in the middle, both just barren deserts. And then after a number of years of doing this, all of a sudden one is just green, full of grass and trees and bushes. The other side is still a barren wasteland. Incredible. And it is, this is tightening up the, uh, the water supply. Like he has, a, he has a property in Zimbabwe and he's been doing this around there. It's just, it's just this verdant paradise now and other places aren't. And so the waterways that go through there, this starts binding, you know, bounding the, the streams and so forth, makes it uh, uh, better so it doesn't just evaporate and dissolve away. So yeah, these other places that, are, that aren't year round water supplies, it's sort of, you know, it's, there's water there in the rainy season, and then it goes away because it's not, it's not able to maintain that his are. So he has, he has year round water going through his property specifically because he does this and then it goes off his property. It goes and it just dissipates and goes away. And so, you know, this is something that we saw in, in Yosemite when they reintroduced wolves, all of a sudden now the deer had to act very differently. They couldn't just sit out, just chewing down, um, you know, the, the, the grass and so forth uh, beyond recognitions. This, this made them like have to be careful being sort of wooded areas only come out and do sort of things because they were, they were being hunted. That's why the bunched and moving thing that savory does this is emulating how animals would move in the wild if they had to worry about predators. And so when you reintroduce pet predators like wolves to Yosemite, all of a sudden everything had to run differently. And it wasn't that they just completely wiped out, you know, the deer population, they, they brought it down a bit, but it, they made them act differently. And this made the, the rivers, uh, banks, uh, tighten up. So they weren't, weren't flooding, they weren't breaking and so forth. There was much more, uh, normal for a, a good, healthy environment. Beavers came back, other animals came back, you know, birds came back, all these things came back. It changed the entire ecology of Yosemite for the better, just by introducing these predators again. And so that's what Savory is doing. He's trying to reintroduce animals to these areas that have you know, had them driven away or they've died off or whatever, whatever's happening. And these things have just turned more and more into deserts because the animals are gone now. Now he's reversing that. So he's been doing this for 40 years. He tells people and shows people in his regenerative agriculture sort of uh, settings that they want to do on their farms. He just tells them how to do it and they do it and they get reproducible results every single time. So, uh, you know, this guy made these claims, these grandiose, uh, you know, Galileic sort of claims about Alan Savory really didn't have anything to back it up. And, um, you know, and, and so, yeah, that, that guy just um, uh, sort of just pissed me off last week is when I'm thinking about it, but. Uh, well, I'm glad know. it got you going on that rant because that was fantastic. Yeah.
yeah, we should do, we'll dig into a bit more of the regenerative, regenerative agriculture topic um, in the future. That'd be a really good one. Um, yeah, but, well, it's yeah. very important too, you know, because you know, people talk about, you know, what well, we eat meatball, but it's not sustainable for everyone to do this because it's so bad for the environment. Yeah, like, buddy, the environment includes animals. Yeah. And if you only have plants, you, it's going to wipe out. You need everything. Everything works. It's an, eco, it's an economic system. It all works mm. together. And, and you know what fertilizer is made out of? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, and, and so, you know, we, we get these crops and so forth and we get the chaff and, and so forth that we don't use. And we give that as animal feed. And then you get the manure from animal to then grow the crops. And people say, it's like, oh, if we weren't growing all these crops just for the, the cows to eat, we'd have plenty of food for everyone. No numb no, nuts. You wouldn't have any ninety three percent. Ninety three percent of the plant material that livestock eat are inedible by humans. Okay, you're talking about the stalks and the plant itself. You know, you have um, you have like soybeans. Oh, like soy is grown and all this stuff is is grown for a cow. They don't eat the soybeans, dude. They're not eating edamame. You know, they're eating the plant that the edamame grew on. Right, which you, which I'm, I'm sure that you're not eating, you know, mm -hmm. and so uh, it's a lie. It's just, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a lie of omission. They're, they're not telling people the whole truth, and so yes, they are eating soy plants. No, they are not eating soy beans, and so um, it's, uh, it's very different. Animals are extremely important for the environment, and growing crops, monocropping you know, strips nutrients out of the soil. It causes harm. You lose topsoil, you lose nutrients, and these things can go barren and you need to use all these chemicals and fertilizers and so forth just to get anything out of the ground at all. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you know, slash and burn uh, forests and jungles and so forth. 55% of Borneo's rainforests have been cut down for palm tree oil, you know, grow, you know, palm oil uh, crops and so forth, killing all the orangutans, killing all the animals. And, it's, and the vegans will, will defend this. The environmental vegans will defend this and say, oh, well, actually, you know, we've replaced this with trees. So, I mean, it's like, you know, it's one for one. Like, it's no different. It's like, well, no, actually, it's very different because that's not a habitat. You know, that's not an ecosystem. You know, maybe there's some birds in there or something like that. There's no orangutans. You know, anything that comes in there and tries to, you know, interrupt that crop gets shot. Okay, so this is this is not the same thing, and you know when you take down, you know, uh, you know they, they talk about you know the Amazon rainforest. Oh, it's being taken down to to have more room for livestock. Yeah, some of it, you know, most of it is to grow soy and and uh, acai berries for your stupid acai bowls, you know, and and that's what's happening. And then these four these fires in the Amazon. This was this was covered up quite significantly, but it was, it was reported that the actual fires in the Amazon a few years ago, when they said, Oh, the Amazon rainforest is, is burning, whatever, which was, was, um, uh, you know, not, not the case. NASA actually had satellite images and actually reported that these that weren't forest fires and they certainly weren't being slashed and burned by, you know, evil capitalists that are trying to burn down the jungle and then just build up a farm. Like, first of all, you, you burn down a jungle. You don't just own it now. You know, you burn down this jungle and you just say, yeah, this is my farm now. I was like, yeah, there's actually, there's actually more rules than that. Okay. And the fires were actually these, these uh, farms that were growing wheat, they were growing uh, these various crops and they harvested the part of the plant that they could sell and make money on. They sold whatever they could for animal feed and the rest was extra. And so they burn it. And that's, that's a normal thing in agriculture. You burn down you know, the dead waste that you're not going to use in order to make room for next year's crop or next season's crop. And so that's what was happening. And in fact, NASA looked at their satellite images and said, this was actually below average for the yearly fires that we see in the Amazon. And they were all farm burns, controlled burns. And you have to do that when you don't have animals, because normally the animals eat down the dead, the dead plants in order to make way for the next next uh season of, of uh, plant we're really and creating all these, all these rods for our own back aren't we by sort of interfering and in, uh and getting in the way i mean it's yeah it's yeah. a vicious cycle yeah well it's like these these like these prescription cascades you see in medicine where you know a, a doctor prescribes something that has these side effects or you prescribe something else and it has different side effects and you keep prescribing and all of a sudden someone's on 17 different medications and they just went in, you know, with high blood pressure. And it's just like, what the hell's going on? Oh man. And so, yeah, that, that's part of the problem. You just start screwing with something and, and you're going to mess it up. 
uh, complex systems are complex and you can't just go tinkering around. A bit like the economy. Yeah, well, that's it. You know, just leave it the <laughs> hell alone and let it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like I'm sorry. It's just that. Well, we need intelligent people to micromanage. Yeah, exactly. You know, the environment right. and the eco- economy, things like that. And I'm like, buddy, you're just not that smart. No, no, you you, know? you, you can't predict the trickle down effects yeah. of all these different decisions. Well, yeah, and and you know, also just you have you have you have individual interactions going on by the billion and every single is, day. Like yeah, you can't yeah. you can't. You can't account for all of those things. Same thing with the environment. There are billions of interactions between plants and animals, animals and animals, plants and plants, and and all the way down the list, all you know um, aspects of life and inorganic matter all interact in very, very unique individual ways that you cannot predict fully. You just have to let the system work on its own. This is what's evolved. This is what's happened. And when you start screwing with that, you will mess it up and it will get worse. Try to let nature do its thing and you're going to be a lot better. And that's what Alan Savory is doing, trying to emulate nature, trying to emulate how animals work in the wild. And this, and this produces the, you know, the effects and the, and the benefits um, in the plant plant world as well. Mm. All right. Let's, let's wrap there. That was awesome. Sounds good. Um, so that's why humans are carnivores guys. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. And, awesome. <laughs> and we could keep going as well, but it's some of the key points that we spoke about was, um, there are the vital nutrients we need as humans can all be found in animals, um, but they can't all be found in plants. Uh, we can't digest fiber, uh, despite, you know, constantly being told to take fiber to help with our digestion or, you know, whatever that's completely made up. Our stomachs are low in pH. They're very acidic, which means that, um, when we were scavenger style animals, uh, you know, we could eat semi-rotten or rotten meat um and still still get nutrients we've got a long uh a small intestine and we've got a short large colon um which indicates that we're not made to eat uh, a crap load of plants um and our teeth our teeth are designed for an animal us who's eating soft meat and um, fat uh, and no we don't go out and kill other animals using our mouths we have hands and weapons for that um, that's why we don't need fangs <laughs> yeah, exactly. and and our appendix and our appendix is a vestigial organ that used to break down fiber and now it's useless and it doesn't break down fiber so then we know that we haven't you know been eating fiber for millions of years okay cool i don't i don't even, don't even have an appendix anymore so that's how yeah, there you useless go. they yeah. are yeah, yeah, exactly. And when, and that's something too, that, you know, I, I theorize, you know, you have a, you have an appendix and you have what they think is you have a fecal lift or a piece of, you know, feces gets stuck in there and it gets, and it gets blocked. And then you have this buildup of bacteria behind it and it can't get free and you get this infection. Uh, what's that trying to do? Um, you're probably eating a lot of fiber and this is designed normally to feed load fiber into that little blind pouch called an appendix, which actually gravity will just, you know, feed it down because as you're, as you're, um, you know, as your small intestine goes into uh, your cecum, it's sort of like the, the appendix is straight down from there. So the gravity will just feed it down if you're standing up. And so, you know, you can ostensibly uh, imagine that, you know, it's the, it's the introduction of fiber that has actually increased the amount of the cases of, uh, of uh, appendicitis is something that I'd, I'd have to look at the numbers for, but I would not be surprised if I found that. Interesting. Yeah, it could be our fiber consumption that's causing all these, mm. all this appendicitis. Fantastic. All right, Dr. Chafee, thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll speak again. No worries, buddy. Good to see you.